Did you know that some plants, such as lettuce and cabbage, consist almost entirely of leaves, having only a short stem and some roots? All foliage leaves have chlorophyll, even plants with red or purple leaves. The red or purple due to such large amounts of red pigment hiding the chlorophyll, but it's still there and photosynthesizing. Hi, I'm Dr. DeBusk, and in this video, I'm going to talk about the function and external structure of leaves. The term leaf brings to mind a large, flat, green structure involved in photosynthesis, like this elephant ear. There are numerous leaf modifications that have evolved as a result of natural selection and provide various non-traditional -trad functions. This includes protection using spines or the bud scales on leaves waiting to emerge. Tendrils function as support for vines. Bulbs store carbohydrates while the top portion of the plant dies and the plant lies in wait until the, it is the right time to emerge. In areas where soil nitrogen levels are poor, carnivorous plants trap and digest insects for their nutrients. Yummy. For a basic leaf, photosynthesis is the most obvious function, but that leaf has so many other functions cannot lose too much water, or allow fungi, bacteria, or algae to get in. They also can't be too tasty to animals or they are a liability. They can't act as a sail or be blown over with a mild wind. The leaves also have to be cheap enough that the plant spends less carbohydrate building them than it recovers in photosynthesis. Many structural and physiological aspects make them waterproof, pathogen resistant, and so on, but it interferes with photosynthesis. During photosynthesis, leaves absorb carbon dioxide and convert it to carbohydrate using light energy. Because sunlight comes in from one direction, it is best for a portion of the light of the leaf to be flat and wide, allowing maximum exposure to the light and maximum surface area to carbon dioxide absorption. Because chlorophyll absorbs sunlight efficiently, light penetrates only a short distance and the leaves can be quite thin. In a thick leaf, light cannot penetrate to the bottom of the leaf, and those cells cannot photosynthesize, but it helps conserve water. A spherical leaf has a lot of internal shading, and only a small fraction of cells receive enough light for photosynthesis. A needle is in a cylindrical leaf with a large surface area and no self-shading, but it doesn't have the same volume. These plants tend to be in drier areas, so their leaves are designed to conserve water. The flat light harvesting portion is the leaf blade, or lamina. The blade's lower side is its dorsal surface and larger veins protrude like backbones. The upper side of the leaf is the ventral surface and is usually rather smooth. Most leaves have a petiole that helps keep the leaves from shading each other, which would defeat the usefulness of the leaf. Petioles also allow blades to flutter in the wind, cooling the leaf and bringing fresh air and carbon dioxide to its surface. Small or long and narrow leaves may have no petiole. These are called sessile instead of petiolate. Aeonium tabuliform grows in intense sunlight. Self-shading is not a problem, but water conservation is. Close packing minimizes water loss from stomata. Long and tapered monocot leaves have no petiole. The base wrap, wraps around the stem to form a sheathing leaf base. A leaf blade may be either simple or compound. A simple leaf has just one part, whereas a compound leaf has a blade divided into several individual parts or leaflets. Each is attached to a petiole lull as an extension of the petiole the rachis. There are several advantages associated with compound leaves. Leaflets can flex in the wind or water, minimizing wind resistance and preventing tearing. Increased turbulence around leaflets can increase heat removal and carbon dioxide uptake. Pests and diseases may spread less quickly. When it comes to compound leaves, leaves may be palmately compound, with all leaflets attached at the same point, pinnately compound, with leaflets attached individually along the rachis, or bipinnately compound, where each leaflet is divided into more leaflets. There are three guidelines to distinguish a simple leaf from a pinnately compound leaf. Leaflets never bear buds in the axils of their petioles. The tip of the rachis never has a terminal bud, and leaflets are always arranged in two rows, never in a spiral, world, or desiccate phylotaxy. So when you're out there looking at leaves, look for the bud. 
There is a tremendous range of shapes of leaves and leaflets as well as different types of leaf margins. It helps greatly with plant identification. A large number of species has several types of leaves. Beans have two types of leaves. The very first leaf formed by the seedling is simple, but later leaves are compound. This Zara lanceolata shoot appears to have two types of leaves. The larger leaves are true leaves, whereas the smaller ones are actually enlarged stipules. Many stipules help protect the bud. Within a leaf are veins or bundles of vascular tissue. These distribute water from the stem into the leaf and simultaneously collect sugars produced by photosynthesis and carry them to the stem for use or storage somewhere else. Eudicot veins occur in a netted pattern of reticulate venation, as in the ficus leaf. Leaves have such dense networks of vascular bundles or veins that every cell is close to cells of xylem and phloem. Leaf veins typically occur closer than do capillaries in our bones, tendons, and cartilage. The venation of eudicots can be further classified as pinnate, where the veins extend from the midrib, palmate, where the veins radiate from the petiole like a fan, and dichotomous, where the veins are forked like in this ginkgo. Monocot leaves tend to be long and strap-shaped, as in this cocktail. Monocot leaves have parallel venation, as you see in this microscopic view of the corn leaf. At the leaf base, usually in the petiole, is an abscission zone. After abscission, adjacent undamaged cells become corky, forming a protective leaf scar. This happens in the fall as deciduous leaves begin to die or when the leaf is damaged. This concludes the section on functions and external anatomy of leaves.